from Springfield, Massachusetts, the Hall of Fame game, next. The largest crowd ever to witness the Hall of Fame game, a sellout at the Springfield, Massachusetts Civic Center, the home of the Basketball Hall of Fame. Tonight, the Chicago Bulls and the world champion, Los Angeles Lakers. I always like to say that Michael got to play with me for a year at North Carolina. <laughs> I think it really helped him. Spectacular player from the beginning. You can see right away Jordan was going to be a big time scorer. And showed what an impact he was going to have on the league. This is NB88, celebrating the 30 year anniversary of Michael Jordan's Chicago Bulls and the 1988 NBA season. Now here are your hosts, Adam Ryan and Aaron Steen. Welcome back to another episode of NB88, up to episode two in the series, Aaron. Uh, welcome to you. Uh, how are you today, mate? Welcome to the NB88 exhibition season, Adam. Yes, mate. If you're new to the show, welcome. If you're a regular listener, welcome back. Before we get into the main topic today, mate, let's have a quick look at some history of this Hall of Fame game. Uh, the first Hall of Fame game was played back in November of 1972 between the Boston Celtics and Detroit Pistons. Now, interestingly... The NBA and ABA seasons were actually already underway. Wow. So a break in both leagues' schedules allowed this game to happen. Has that for a tidbit? Yeah, that's a beauty. Uh, I did a bit of research ahead of our chat today, and we've got a bit of additional research from the Doy and himself, Todd Spear, in a moment. The game was played at the Springfield Civic Center. Uh, it was a new arena that was officially opened earlier that same year of 1972. Now, the building is now known apparently as Mass Mutual Center. And for what it's worth, the Celtics won that inaugural game, 119 to 117. Hmm. Now, the game was played annually through 1979. There was no game in 1980. The event resumed in 81 and went through to at least the year 2000. When the event resumed, the games would then take place in the preseason as opposed to within the course of the regular season. For minutia lovers, a game was played in 1964 and 1965 the proceeds of which also benefited the Hall of Fame. However, those games were not under the same umbrella as the Hall of Fame game concept that we're chatting about now. So major kudos here, mate, to, of course, our great friend Todd Spear, at Todd Spear, so it's S-P-E-H-R 35 on Twitter. Thanks, Todd, for that. Great stuff. Yeah, I've uh, I've since unbookmarked the NBA website and basketball reference because I now have just used Todd. <laughs> Now, Adam, modern day exhibition games definitely don't really do it for me, but the opportunity to see the 1987 88 Bulls lineup in a rarity called a circulated 1987 preseason game was far too good to miss, uh, especially seeing Pippen and Grant in the infancy of their NBA career uh, is a real treat. From the time that he was drafted by the Bulls, I've been a Derek Rose fan, partly because I've seen his career right from the beginning and Along those lines, I'm going to get a real kick out of seeing Horace and Scotty's career from the beginning. Yeah, this is a, a great game to have access to. It's uploaded on YouTube. I'll include a link to that in the show notes. If you just search 1987 Hall of Fame game, you'll pretty much find it straight away. The full game's up there. Unusual, I guess, to have a preseason game which has appeared online from this era. Uh, it doesn't often happen, but I guess because of the teams involved, somebody had the foresight to keep the recording on videotape, and then, of course, that's made its way online. Chicago Bulls 1987-88 preseason. All right, mate. So let's jump in the uh, good old DeLorean and key in November 3 of 1987. It was the 15th annual Hall of Fame game. And the Chicago Bulls took on the LA Lakers at the Springfield Civic Center in Massachusetts in front of a capacity crowd of 9,265. Uh, the game was broadcast by TBS and the commentators were the great Bob Neal and the legend Rick Barry. Great friend of the show, of course, Rick. And uh, had Craig Sager as well as the sideline reporter throughout the game too. Now, coaches for the Bulls, of course, Doug Collins. And for the Lakers, the great Pat Riley. Now, this was the final preseason game for both teams. And as per Bob Neal, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, sinus infection, and Magic Johnson, tendonitis on his left Achilles, were back home in California and did not play. Uh, Bob Neal also mentioned that they were looking forward to watching Bulls rookie, Scottie Pippen first quarter. In the first play of the game, the Bulls recently acquired Artis Gilmore was rejected at the rim by Mike Schmreck, uh, a former Chicago Bull, uh, hashtag NB86. They mentioned during the game that Artis had been playing well in the preseason up to this point, had uh, 
pretty quiet game in this one, though, and it was off to a quiet esque start with the uh, the block from Mike. Don't call me Shrek, Smrek. <laughs> A couple of minutes later, Jordan drove down the middle of the lane and was rejected by Mike Schmerk, <laughs> and that led to an easy fast break basket for AC Green, who tied the scores at four apiece. A few possessions later, Oak corralled a rebound and dished out a no-look outlet to MJ near half court, and Jordan threaded a gorgeous bounce pass to a slashing Brad Sellers for the big-time jam, and the Bulls were up eight to six. Oakley keys the break. Three on two. Beautiful pass, the jam from Sellers, from Michael Jordan. Now returning from an ad break, with the Lakers up 12-10, Bob Neal cut to a pre-recorded clip with MJ and coach Doug Collins, referencing Jordan's walkout from Bulls practice the week that preceded this Hall of Fame game. Uh, We discussed this in detail in episode one of NB88. The slight verbal altercation between uh, Doug Collins and uh, Michael Jordan in a uh, practice game. They were playing a pickup practice game, and there was an argument between the two of them over what the right score was, and Jordan walked out of the gym, and we talked to the two of them prior to today's game about the relationship between the superstar Jordan and his coach, Doug Collins. I think it's going well. Uh, we had a little argument here and there, but best friends have arguments, and uh, he's my coach, and I respect whatever he says, and uh, it's a coach-player relationship and even a better relationship off the court little assistant coaching here from Michael? <laughs> More or less. He was a referee at the time, and I was a coach at the time. So. Barry, you were a superstar Hall of Famer. You know how Michael Jordan feels about dealing with his coach, right? Oh, there's no problem. I got along with all my coaches. <laughs> <laughs> I could name some that we could get controversial with. Now, with just over six minutes remaining, Bob and Rick both commented on the great Dave Corzine and how his appearance had changed since the end of the 1986 season. And Dave Corzine... It will be into a different role this year. Well, look at him. I mean, he's lost about 20 pounds. He shaved off that beard. I mean, he actually looks like a ball player now. He looks like a tall Omar Sharif. Very good. That's true. And a younger one also. Omar Sharif, good name for a ball player. Corzine on the turnaround. In the fourth quarter, Bob Neal jokingly mentioned that the loss of his beard would be more significant than the 20 pounds that he lost. <laughs> That's exactly right. Apparently, the other humor was lost on the great Rick Barry as he then corrected Bob in saying that, no, the 20 pounds would be more beneficial. <laughs> A long two from Byron Scott extended the Lakers' lead to 7, 17 to 10. Now, moments later, we're treated to some back-to-back gold. Jordan, after a series of moves and fakes, dished off to an open Sellers for another hammer dunk. Then going the other way, James Worthy hit a gorgeous finger roll that evoked memories of the Iceman, George Gervin, and James had eight points early on. Former Bull, George Gervin. Oh, that's true. I should have mentioned that as well. Former Bull, uh, hashtag NB86 yet again. Jordan racked up points six and seven on a 19-footer, but the Bull still trailed 24 to 19. And with about three minutes left in the first, Scott Pippen checked in for the first time. And Scott Pippen, number 33... From central Arkansas. Well, very uh, interesting story for this young man. He started out as working either as the team manager or something as a freshman in college and wound up being an All-American player, one of the top draft picks. And he is an outstanding talent. I've seen him play in the exhibition season, Bob, and he's a fine athlete, and they're going to get a lot of good play out of Scotty Pippen over the years. Worthy reached double figures early in this game with a beautiful up-and-under type move on the left side of the hoop and extended the Lakers' lead back to seven. 28-21. 28-21. to 21. Pippen's first shot was a 22-footer, and he nailed it. Had a foot just inside the three-point line. A good confidence booster for Scott. And the Bulls' <laughs> other first-round pick of the 87 draft, Horace Grant, entered the game with one minute and six seconds remaining in that first quarter. For Chicago, and into the ball game, Horace Grant. The Lakers' Kurt Rambis scored with two seconds left, and after one, LA led 36-29. to 29. Jordan had already racked up 13 points in the period. A funny start to the second quarter. Bob Neal said that Lakers coach Pat Riley believes that Los Angeles pay Kurt Rambis $500,000 a year to inbound the ball. (laughs) Hello to Kurt, if you're listening. (laughs) Chicago opened the second term with friend of the show Threat, Jordan, (laughs) Pippen, Grant and Dati Corzine before (laughs) Tony White checked in early in the term in his number 11 Bulls jersey. This put three rookies on the floor for the Bulls. Now, on White, Neil said that former Bull and current Laker Wes Matthews is listed at 6'1", one inch shorter than Tony White, yet White was clearly shorter than Matthews on the floor. Someone's math's not quite white. 
if Wes Matthews was actually on the floor, he'd be about like <laughs> a foot and a half tall, I would have thought. But anyway. I saw where that was going and I really enjoyed it even as you were mid-thought. It had been reported that the Bulls wanted a backup point guard for John Macbeth Paxson. It was a pity that Sadal Threat wasn't able to fill that role as more of a two guard because his jump shooting and play off the ball, I think, would have really helped the Bulls uh, as he hit his first two jumpers in the quarter. Soon after, James Worthy was called for an offensive foul on a push-off on Dave Corzine. Rick Barry said it was a questionable call, and after the slow-mo replay that showed Worthy pushing Corzine into the fifth row with his (laughs) off-arm. Horace made the score 43-36 to Chicago after Pippen drove the scene, got a Laker defender in the air, then dumped it off to Horace to complete a 14-0 Bulls run. A couple of possessions later, an overplay had Worthy wide open for a baseline score, only to have Pippen show his athleticism and block his shot from behind. Rick Barry added soon after that that Doug Collins expressed his willingness to put the ball in Pippen's hands because he's such a good ball handler at six foot seven. Yeah, some good points there. And in the second quarter particularly, the rookies, Tony White, Scott Pippen, and Horace Grant all contributed to that Bulls run and uh, got the Bulls right back on track before the half. The Lakers' first field goal came after a five-minute drought and was then followed by a former Bull Wes Matthews three-point play opportunity. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Uh, funny stuff. Scott was caught with a mismatch with (laughs) Mike Smreck on him in the post. Scotty got him in the air, took an extra step, maybe actually travelled, but then dunked the ball in a very pretty move. The Lakers plugged Jeff Lamp in and the Bulls... (laughs) Lead was cut to four <laughs> points as he immediately hit a baseline jumper. He was a shining light for the Lakers. He was. Horace Grant then kept the ball alive by back tapping an offensive rebound. Then Scott caught a pass on the baseline and finished it in a very athletic play with a score. Scotty then forced Worthy into a travel at the other end, and he was on fire at this point in time. Mm. With 4.30 to go, Los Angeles forced a turnover, finishing with an AC green slam so hard, break your TV screen. Hello to the Red Hot Chili Peppers if you're listening. (laughs) Dropping some lyrics there, mate. Uh, Is that the same song, and I'm terrible with songs, where they have the lyrics, LA Lakers, Fast Break Makers? Or is that a different song? 89, they actually brought out a song called Magic Johnson. May have been from that song. Good to get a bit of Red Hot Chili Pepper action though, mate. You're welcome. (laughs) Meet the Bulls team you've been waiting for. Charles Oakley, Michael Jordan, Horace Grant, Scott Pippen, Artis Gilmore, and Doug Collins. The Chicago Tribune presents the 1987-88 Bulls tip-off luncheon, Thursday, November 5th at noon at the Hyatt Regency Hotel. To order your Bulls Tribune tip-off luncheon tickets, fill out the form available in the Chicago Tribune. Reservations for the 87-88 Bulls tip-off luncheon are $25 each. Make checks payable to Chicago Bulls Luncheon. Proceeds to benefit Chicago Tribune charities and charitables. Thank you, Bulls fans. Chicago Tribune, Chicago's best sports section. Mail to Chicago Bulls 87-88 Tip-Off Luncheon, 980 North Michigan Avenue, Suite 1600, Chicago, Illinois, 60611. Please be advised, this event is sold out. Note, this is not an actual sponsorship. It's purely for fun. Real sponsors welcomed. With three minutes to go, big game James hit Sellers with a beautiful move to the hoop, finishing with an up-and-under spectacular for the score. And after a Chicago timeout, the freshly checked in for the Bulls' Michael Jordan got Michael Cooper on the low block and finished with an even more spectacular scoop shot that drew an oh my from Bob Neal as Jordan jumped past Cooper, which defensively took Coop out of the play. Jordan! That's the good description. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, read them and weep, says Michael. 56-53. Bulls. With just under two minutes, Brad Sellers hit Oakley as Oak thundered down the lane for a nice and one play, and Jordan followed that with two offensive rebounds off an Oakley and his own miss to make it 63-59 to Bulls. Two Jordan free throws was the final score for the half after Neil and Barry added that Doug was on the all-gum-chewing team (laughs) and was in mid-season form with his strong jaw. (laughs) That's great. Now, the Bulls trailed by seven after one quarter and led by seven 
67 to 60 at the half. Entering the third quarter, the Bulls' first score came via Artis Gilmore, and he scored the easy jam off a nice feed from Brad Sellers. Uh, it almost actually goes without saying that the A train conducted himself very well. Toot toot. I mean, he here. <laughs> uh, don't want to derail us too much, mate. <laughs> Courtesy of a sweeping lefty hook in the lane, Worthy brought the Lakers within five, 69 to 64, giving him 23 points on the evening to that point. Byron Scott then hit a gorgeous layup from under the basket a few moments later. He's sometimes overlooked, actually, when it comes to the greatness of those 1980s Showtime Lakers. And Worthy continued to dazzle for LA, hitting a long two, which gave him 27 points and brought the Lakers to within three points at this stage. It was 74 to 71. A few minutes later, Michael Jordan rejected what looked to be a James Worthy running hook. The ball landed in Salas' hands, and the seven-footer drove the length of the floor to lay it in. And at that stage, the Bulls led 80-75 to 75 with just over five minutes remaining in the period. So on that score, you might like to say that the seven-footer hit a zero-footer. Yes. Yeah, you would. <laughs> I'm slow on the uptake today, I know. <laughs> I had to literally play that through my mind after you told me. With Jordan at the free throw line, Bob and Rick waxed lyrical on the addition of Pippen to the Bulls. As we watch Pippen come into the ball game with Michael Jordan at the free throw line, Rick, let's assume Pippen has a great rookie year and hope the best for the young man. How will he work into an offense with a Michael Jordan? There's only one ball. Oh, I mean, he knows that Scott is a talent. Uh, I'm sure that Doug Collins will come up and devise plays to get Pippen the basketball, and there are going to be times when Michael has to rest, and if that happens and Pippen turns out to be the player they hope he can be, he'll be the guy that'll have the ball the majority of the time. Courtesy of back-to-back jumpers from Jordan, the Bulls extended the lead out to seven points, and MJ had already racked up 30-plus for the game. Just a few plays later, Jordan went into the great heat-check territory as he drove the lane, drawing the contact, and then hitting a pretty bucket off glass and the foul. He'd make the free throw to complete the three-point play. And then, undoubtedly, the highlight of the game and an indelible moment in Jordan law came late in this third quarter. Jordan, after completing one of his patented from-behind blocks on an unsuspecting AC Green, took the outlet pass from the great man Dave Corzine and threw down his immortal Come Fly With Me jam. Here's Jordan! Oh, give him a 10! Well, the fans had to wait approximately 33 and a half minutes to get one of those. It was worth it. Largest lead of the game for the Bulls by 12. Now, listen to my podcast chat with legendary NBA photographer, Andrew Bernstein, a detailed retelling of how this Come Fly With Me cover photo came to be. Chicago would outscore Los Angeles 34-27 to in the third period to take a commanding 101-87 to lead. The two main Bulls rookies were very prominent at the start of the fourth term with Scottie Pippen bringing up the ball on the first position and Horace scoring on an offensive rebound. Dave Corzine did his best Bill Winnington impersonation with an athletic one-handed putback of a Horace Grant miss. Soon after, Scott found Tony White for a score under the hoop and Rick Barry called Pippen a, and I quote, fine natural basketball player, end quote and that he has the court sense that a lot of rookies do not have. For all that's said about Rick Barry and how people don't like him on the court and that might lead to off-the-court issues, I reckon his analysis of the game and what he actually was saying at this time was pretty spot on. Yeah. Of course, he was one of the greatest to ever play the game, but I think it was underrated, his commentating ability, and for some reason, which we did briefly allude to in my conversation with him when he was a guest on the podcast, um... He finished up his broadcasting in the late 1980s and didn't really get much of a look in at all throughout the 1990s and beyond. Yeah. This game really was the Pippen and Grant show early in the fourth as Horace blocked a Kurt Ramba shot. Jeff Lamp made his fourth shot early in the fourth term, making him a perfect four for four in the game, and then followed that up with a three-pointer. And you might like to say that Jeff was really setting the scoring table, Lamp. <laughs> As lovers of wordplay and puns, it's really difficult not to make a point to do with his name. Soon after Lamp's triple, Rick Barry said that this fourth quarter was the Scotty Pippen highlight show, and Bob Neal said that Pippen was doing his best Paul Pressey impersonation playing point forward. Hmm. 
It was a 17-point Chicago lead with five minutes remaining, and the game was starting to turn into a DB, a dog's breakfast. <laughs> Hello to Roy and HG if you're listening. <laughs> Soon after, Jeff Lamps fused blue as he missed his first shot, a three-pointer. <laughs> oh, I love it. Just a quick aside, Roy and HG, uh, for those that aren't familiar, are Australian comedians who have been around for the best part of how many decades? Three? A lot. Yeah, a lot of decades. <laughs> there was then the first sighting of Lakers rookie Milton Wagner wearing jersey number 20. Uh, Milt Wagner... Um I couldn't tell you that he wore number 20 without actually checking the greatbasketballreference.com, but the number 20 for the Lakers that springs to mind most for me in the years that would follow is Terry Teagle. Yeah, same. Yeah, from the 1991 NBA Finals, yeah. Terry Teagle uh, could light it up, uh, Jeff Lamp style. Neil and Barry mentioned the upcoming regular season game for the 37th time. <laughs> Maybe, okay, I am prone to hyperbole with some of these figures, but... Uh, but he mentioned on more than one occasion the upcoming Chicago at Atlanta game in seven days' time in the regular season. Of course, we're going to see these Bulls against the Hawks uh, next Tuesday night in Atlanta. That'll be a great one to watch. Horace Grant was stroking the ball beautifully from the outside after hitting an 18-footer, and the Bulls lineup at this time was Paxson, Sellers, Grant, and friends of the show Mike Brown as an R3. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when we can have plural <laughs> mentions of Friends of the show, that is fantastic. Hello to each gentleman if you're listening to. Just to show you how sloppy that the game had uh, turned into down the stretch, as you can see, a lot of my breakdown now isn't of the game itself. It's more from a commentary of the game. Bob Neal then spoke of Doug Collins calling Pat Riley an idol of his, despite the fact that both were current NBA coaches. On being told this, Riley added that if he was going to be his idol, Doug needed to get a can of hairspray. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Tell you what, you know to roll me up. With just over a minute to go, Horace hit a 20-footer from the top of the key to give him 16 points. Chicago's final score of the game was a friend of the show, Mike Brown, 12-foot turnaround. The new Washington Monument, I think his nickname was, so... <laughs> Great man there, Mike Brown. The buzzer ends this exhibition game, the final one of the 1987 season. 128-114 Chicago. Chicago ended its preseason with a 5-4 and four record, and this was the Lakers' sole preseason loss. 7-1 and one they would go. Here's a few quick stats. For Chicago, Jordan finished with 36 points on 12-19 and 19 from the field. A quick amendment to the Bulls' box score that will uh, retrospectively fit into NB 88-1. Uh, Horace Grant, 8 for 10 from the field for 16 points. So thank you, Aaron, for uh, pointing that out, mate. Uh, never take Horace for granted when it comes to box scores. I should have goggled it first. Goggles, there we go. Lovely. Brad Sellers had 14 points. Charles Oakley and Dave Corzine each recorded 12 points and 9 boards. And Tony White, another of the Bulls rookies, uh, finished with 8 points. For the Lakers, James was definitely worthy with 31 points. I might have to retire that. That's just getting a bit too much. AC Green had 18 points and 9 boards. Michael Cooper, Wes Matthews and Jeff Lamp, 11 points apiece. Thanks again, Aaron, for being a part of the show, mate. Look forward to getting into our next episode where we start to recap the regular season proper. Anything you'd like to add before we round things out? Yes, mate. Let's check out of the game Jeff Lamp style. Click. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and share my web address with your friends and colleagues in allairness.com. Check out the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with high-profile guests. Follow me on Twitter at inallairness. Please add your like to the show's social hub, facebook.com slash inallairness. Join me next time for another edition of the show. <laughs> oh. I was amped to get those Jeff Lamp mentions. What was the halftime score, do you know? You should probably find that out, shouldn't we? Uh, what was it? It was um, 46 to 39, I think it was. Uh, no. The score at the half was 46 to 39. No, absolutely not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jordan's offensive rebound and putback made it 63 to 59. <laughs> so at worst, it was 65 to 59. I told you I wasn't good at math. Not even close. Ha, 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 ha.
I've really been paying attention, haven't I? The completest in me needs to know. Um, what I said, forty six thirty nine. <laughs> Come on, show the graphic. <coughs> okay, <laughs> uh, the Bulls led. <laughs> the Bulls led sixty seven to sixty at the half. There we go. And brought the Lakers to within three points at this stage. It was sixty seventy four to seventy one. <laughs> I'm just make, I'm yeah. making stuff up. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> making it up. Horace had 16, I thought they said. Did he really? Yeah. Why did I not mention that? Because I've just copied and pasted that straight from NB88-1. So uh, if I've overlooked him in that, that's pretty poor form too. Mm. I'm having a quick look now. I don't know. Yeah, well, I'm just going on what <laughs> I'm reasonably certain they said during the game. <laughs> okay, hang on. This is making for great radio. I just realized you are right. Grant was 8 for 10 for 16 points. Word. <laughs> 